Good morning to each of you. I've been preaching on mission, mission locally, then mission nationally, and today international mission. And I, today I'm thinking about it this way. The book of Acts, we call it formally the Acts of the Apostles. Today I'm looking at Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Jesus gives a picture, a vision of mission to the whole, uh, to the whole group of disciples. The disciples are standing around him, and it, it says, Lord, is this the time you will restore the kingdom of Israel? That's verse 6. The answer comes in verse 8, where Jesus paints this big picture Here's what you guys are going to do. Here's where you're going to go. That's not the answer they wanted. Not at all. We're, we're talking about Israel, and you're talking about the whole world, Lord. Did you hear us? He heard him, but he had a vision. Now, why would they not hear his vision? Let's, let's hear the vision first. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. I think these disciples are very human like you and me. Uh, you know, they're concerned with what's going on now. Their country has been invaded by the Romans and people are being crucified and terrorized, all sorts of stuff. That's what they know the day to day. And so they say, Jesus, are you going to take care of this? And Jesus' answer is this big, lovely vision. You know, and they're going, hmm. That's, like I said, that's not the answer they wanted. They're concerned with what's going on before their eyes and the problems they've got. But Jesus has big visions. It's, a, it's not Jesus' vision to shove the hated Romans into the Mediterranean Sea. That's probably what they would have liked. No, Jesus' vision, he looks at the whole world. He's looking beyond this time and that place. And he says, I've got a vision of how you're going to bring me and the gospel to the whole world what God's kingdom will grow up into be, what the church will become. And of course, the disciples are, hmm. I think, but when you think about the disciples, I can't point too many fingers at them because I think we're pretty much the same way. You know, if you ask me, hey, how's your day going? And you go, oh, okay. Or maybe it's, hey, it's a great day. Or it's a rotten day. Or whatever. You know, we're pretty much focused on ourselves, right? And what's going on in our own life. And if someone comes along and paints a big vision for us, we go, what planet is he standing on almost? You know, we, we just, we don't, sometimes we don't want to hear visions because our life isn't very visionary itself. We're thinking about our own stuff, our own friends, our own neighbors, our own lives. But Jesus has this worldwide vision, this worldwide missionary vision. And so I think what we have to go back here maybe is to some catechism. I cannot believe in Jesus Christ nor come to him, but the Holy Ghost has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the one true faith, even as he calls, gathers, and enlightens the whole Christian church on earth. Maybe you, if you were raised Lutheran, you know that one, because it's part of Martin Luther's explanation to the third article of the Creed. But while that's an interesting statement, and while we may have learned it many years ago, it's the kind of thing that says, I can't quite grab Jesus' vision. But here in, in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, Jesus is bringing the vision. He says, disciples, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. 
And this spirit is going to be so powerful, and it's going to fill you. And, of course, it did come and fill them at Pentecost, and God did use those disciples to begin the church. And those men and women who were, let's say, a bit timid and faltering and, you know, weren't sure, they went forth with the Holy Spirit in them, and they went to all parts of the known world right then. And they started boldly proclaiming Jesus Christ. Oh, sure, they suffered some persecution. They had to go to strange foreign countries, probably eat food they didn't know, and live a very simple life. But they went. The power of God's Holy Spirit was, is beyond any power that you and I can imagine. It's even beyond the powers of nature, if you will. It's beyond the powers of the evil plots in our own world. Now, the second part of verse 8 tells the, the big picture of mission. He says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Did you hear those geographic designations here? You start with Jerusalem. That's the town where they're at. So he says, you're going to be a witness right here in this city. Then you're going to go out into all Judea. So you're going to go out into the local county and state, if you will. And then you're going to be witnesses in Samaria. Samaria wasn't so far away, but it was a foreign country because the Jews were hated there. So that was a strange place to go. And then finally, Jesus says, you're going to be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. So here we have local, national, and international. It's just spreading how it goes. Now, we know that the disciples did go forth, and the church began. And, of course, you and I are sitting here 2,000 years later as a result of that mission. And 2,000 years later, the church of Christ has grown up into almost every country in this world. The Bible has been translated into thousands of languages. And there's much good news that you and I, can we can travel the world over and probably find somebody in every country who loves Jesus and is worshiping him. Ah, but there's much news that is not so good. Not so good. In Europe... About a thousand years ago, they built those big, vast cathedrals. And if you've been over to one of those, oh, you walk in and you go, oh, wow, look at this. You know, everything is beautiful and just, and you're just awed by it. And they took, you know, 100, 200 years to build. But sadly, those cathedrals are now basically empty. They've almost just become museums, kind of museums of the past, if you will. When I lived in Germany for a year, the Germans had a saying, you go into church three times in your life, three times in your life, and twice you're carried in. Okay? The first time you're carried in when you're baptized. You're a baby. The second time you walk in when you're confirmed, so then you can walk, you're 14. The third time you're carried in because it's your funeral. Now, isn't that sad when you hear that? Because the place of Jesus Christ in those societies has just faded. And those churches are empty. The church in, in Germany has become a largely, a, let's say, a social service agency, providing services to people that need them. And... When you come to our country, I see, see us on the same path in many ways. We're not really growing here. Religious values are in decline, and uh, people have become very secular. Religion in the public square is pretty much frowned on. But good news now. In Africa and in parts of Asia, the Christian church is growing rapidly. It really is. It's busting loose. In the 1950s, the Lutheran church in Ethiopia, Makana Jesus, had a few thousand people. 
Today, it has over 7 million people, and it's growing strong. Yeah. Growing rapidly. And that is typical of the Christian church in Africa, which is growing very, very strong. So God's Holy Spirit has moved and is in Africa and parts of Asia powerfully. I would now turn here to the uh, Middle East, which is all, almost mu totally Muslim in faith. And while there are, is much bad news, there are some bright spots. There is a Christian radio station in the country of Lebanon. And at that Christian radio station, they have a big, powerful, you know, 50,000 watt deal. And they broadcast Christian worship and music and all sorts of stuff all over the Middle East. Well, they get these letters back pretty much anonymously, I think, from Muslims who say, I also want to follow Jesus Christ. But the bad news there is strong. You may recall these words from John chapter 16, verse 2. The time will come when men will kill you and think they are offering a service to God. Sadly, that time is upon us in much of the Middle East. Christians are being killed daily in Iraq, in Syria, and other Middle Eastern countries. It's very sad. The Islamic State, ISIS, has proclaimed that it's a Muslim's duty to kill Christians and other infidels. The city of Mosul, Iraq, about 20, 25 years ago, had 160,000 Christians. Today, there are no churches left. They've all been pulled down and the Christians have been scattered and they're all in hiding. Maybe they're part of that refugee group going through Europe, I don't know. This past February, you may remember 21 Christians were, were killed in Libya. Well, those 21 Christians, as they were beheaded, their final words were, my Lord Jesus, my Lord Jesus. Tough to hear that stuff. In July, in Dallas, Diane and I heard a Bible study led by Reverend Bassam Abdullah. He is pastor of First United Lutheran Church in Hammond, Indiana. Anyway, Basim Abdallah grew up in Jerusalem as a little boy, where he said he got whacked in the head for being a Christian. Here's what he wrote. I know firsthand the evil and the pain of being a Christian in an intolerant world. Satan plans our destruction. I have heard the cries of my Christian family in this world. And we should not give up on the power of the Lord to change these men and women. We have to bring them to the foot of the cross of Jesus with penitent hearts and contrite minds, believing that Jesus is their Lord. The blood of the saints are eternally joyful in the presence of God. Another presentation we heard in Dallas was from the mission director of the North American Lutheran Church, Reverend Gementius Buba. He's really a dynamic and interesting guy. If he came here to preach, you'd all light up, believe me. Anyway, Gementius said, we need to witness to the whole world. And when we go to places like foreign lands or even foreign territory in our own country, he says, here's how we go. Number one, we must go forth. We must go forth even into the lion's den and even into the fiery furnace. We must go forth. Number two, we must be assured of Jesus and we are assured of Jesus' protection and, 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 and presence. Number three, we approach everyone with love and respect. 
everyone. Number four, we let them know of our own need for Christ's forgiveness, not of our self-righteousness. Number five, we pass on to them what we have received from Jesus. We have received forgiveness of our sins and we have received freedom from death and the devil. Number six, we share the gospel. We are not silent, we share the gospel. And finally, number seven, we depend on the Holy Spirit as the apostle Paul did in the book of Acts. Do you remember that apostle Paul? The first nine chapters of Acts, he's the great persecutor of the church, killing people, imprisoning them. And then he becomes the great evangelist of the church, writing many of our New Testament letters. God can work where you and I don't see it possible. God's Holy Spirit can take people that you and I think can never come to Christ. Oh, they can come. We have been led into mission right here at Trinity by Michael and Lupe Geis, who are in Nepal, the country of Nepal spreading Christ. We've been led by Michael and Judy White, who went to Ethiopia for many years. And it's time for us now to step forward and figure out how can I do mission, mission in the name of Christ and be one of his disciples. Truly the world awaits us and Christ is with us. Amen. Offering, okay.
Can we please rise for our prayers? Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. O Lord, give us ears to hear the message of the cross and grant us your Holy Spirit that we may bear the cross faithfully as we follow Jesus. Renew your church around the world and especially here in North America. Send your word forth in the power of the Holy Spirit to bring many to faith and discipleship. Lord, in your mercy, guide all pastors and teachers and musicians and other leaders in our congregation. Especially we pray for our Sunday school teachers, adult education teachers and choir directors, that the Holy Spirit may fill them richly. Lord, in your mercy, send peace throughout the world with freedom and justice for all people. We pray especially for the persecuted church. Yes, for Lord, for those who are killed and even injured for your name. Turn the hearts of all who hate and oppose the gospel and open them to your saving word. Lord, in your mercy. Protect and keep all European refugees in your care. May the churches of Europe welcome those lost souls and show them the love and mercy of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for the sick, the unemployed, the discouraged, the confused, and all who need your healing in any way, especially Martha. We pray for colleges, college students, and those away from home, that they may hear the word of Jesus wherever they are and follow you. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort those who care for the sick and dying. Let the light of your cross and the promise of the resurrection strengthen those to whom death draws near and those who mourn the loss of loved ones, especially the family of Janet Graybill, and Connie Osborne, bring us together to the land of the living to enjoy eternal fellowship with you and all the saints, Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Father, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, he broke it, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. We pray the prayer our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated.
God, I give you what I can today. The scattered ashes that I hid away, I lay it all at your feet. From the corners of my deepest shame, the empty places where I've worn your name, show me the love. Say I believe, oh help me to lay it down, oh Lord I lay it down, oh let this be and for all, once and for all. God, I give you what I can today, the scattered ashes that I hid away, I lay it down. From the corners of my deepest shame, the empty places where I've worn your name, show me the love. I say I believe, oh help me to lay it down, oh Lord I lay it down. Oh, There is victory in my Savior's loss, and the crimson flowing from the cross pour over me, pour over me. There is victory in my Savior's loss, and the crimson flowing from the cross pour over me.
once and for all. Once and for all. Once and for all. Once and for Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Saints.